Okay, so it looks like we are live streaming now. Um, a reminder to everyone here that this session is being recorded. Um, to minimize distractions, we have set the chat to host only. So please hold your questions until the end. And with that, I'll turn it over to Peggy Grease. Thank you, Holly. Music King Artistic Director, Dr. Mark Fenskevich is a Baroque cellist and a professor of musicology at the University of Oregon. He teaches the undergraduate and graduate music history surveys of the Renaissance, Baroque, and classical periods, as well as performance practice, Baroque cello, and the early music ensembles in our Collegium Musicum. Graduate seminar topics have included Bach's Sacred Cantatas, Monteverdi, Organology, Baroque Culture, Latin American Baroque Music, 17th Century Italian Sacred Music, Baccarini, French Baroque music from Lully to Rameau, and rhetoric and music. He also teaches a course on styles in history for the humanities program. As a teacher and guest lecturer in Europe, he regularly offers seminars and master classes on various topics in music and performance practice at conservatories in Brussels, The Hague, Amsterdam, Paris, Leipzig, Prague, Bruno, and at universities in Spain, Portugal, and Italy. Fenskevich is also a frequent performer and recording artist with European early music ensembles, including the Capella Musicae uh, di, di San Petronio in Bologna, Le Mufati and More Maiorum in Belgium, Collegium Marianum in Prague, and with the American ensembles, Arcangeli Baroque Strings in Berkeley and the New York State Baroque. His work as a musicologist includes the writing of liner notes and program notes for a variety of CD companies and early music festivals, as well the publication of critical facsimiles and editions. Already available are the facsimiles of Domenico Gabrielli, complete works for cello but solo with basso continuo, Giuseppe Giacchini's Opus 1, and Giovanni Battista dell'Antoni's Opus 1. During yesterday's conference presentation, rediscovering the works of Antonio Vandini, we had an ex excellent example of his methodology in formulating a comprehensive approach to performance practice and archival research. Mark explained how he and cellist Eleanor Fry discovered, edited, published, and in 2019 recorded the previously unknown works of Antonio Vandini. Mark's current research focuses on late 17th century music in Bologna and on the history and repertoire of bass violins, with most recent articles in the yearbook of the Orpheus Institute, in the journal Performance Practice Review, and in the book A Performer's Guide to 17th Century Music. Mark also recently produced a bilingual French and English volume of text with recordings titled Cello Stories, the cello in the 17th and 18th centuries. A complete list of his publications is available on the University of Oregon School of Music and Dance faculty page and on our Musicking website. It is clear from this brief survey of his work that Dr. Van Kavik's activities as a scholar and as a performer exemplify one of the best examples of vibrant musicking. Now, for his perspective on the future of performance practice studies, let us hear his keynote address, George Orwell, Michel Onfray, and Dystopia, the meaning of culturally informed performance practices today. Let us welcome Dr. Mark Venskevic. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you, everyone, for being here, uh, virtually, obviously. Um, Good afternoon. So um, my talk today will not take the whole hour and a half, of course. Uh, so we will have plenty of time for uh, discussion afterwards. But uh, my aim today is to, you know, after 30 years in the profession to sort of reflect a little bit about the uh, meaning of basically what we do with uh, historical performance practice or whatever we want to call that at this point, uh, which I will discuss a little bit too. So 22 years ago, John Butt coined and generalized the term historically informed performance, abbreviated as uh, HIP, thus hip, why not? In, in the sense of fashionable cool of what the 18th century French would have called galon at the time. Uh, in, in this uh, excellent book uh, entitled Playing with History. And I will 
uh, share my screen so that I can show you a few of these elements. Okay, so I hope this works. So in playing with history, um, basically John Butt was able to give the English language um, a term that was somewhat equivalent to the German, to the older German concept of historische Aufführungspraxis. Since 1999, some have uh, turned John Butt's term into historically inspired performance or historically informs performance practice, HIPP, as they use it in the Flemish Conservatory in Brussels, or simply also historical performance practice, uh, which is the term we use here at the University of Oregon. The idea of returning to period instruments emerged in the late 1950s, early 1960s, although the concept already found its roots well before World War II, with such pioneering musicians as uh, Isolde Algrim in Vienna, and there we go, among others. And it obviously needed to be supported by an in-depth study of the user's manuals of these instruments, and even more of reliable scores from a philological point of view and of a reconstruction of the historical context in which the music had been created. Of course, it was certainly not a question of returning to the music as it had been thought or heard by the composer, something that is impossible to achieve anyway, but to confront some sort of institutionalized cultural hegemonic pretentiousness, or is it just intellectual laziness, through which musicians preferred to accept that musical notation as a semiotic system had always and invariably meant the same thing ever since the Renaissance. Even though we all know that the notation is not the music and that music is not, that music does not exist without its being a sound event, many still consider the score to be the ultimate source for its realization in sound and choose not to reflect too much upon the complete cultural context in which this musical product was created. Opponents of this new approach quickly attempted to defend their convictions by claiming that this hip stuff <clears throat> made no sense given that today's audiences do not have historical ears either. Although this is true, of course, this observation has unfortunately too often been used as a rhetorical figure, the so-called chleuasmus or epicertomasis which aims only at sarcastically mocking the, ad the adversary. On the other hand, some critics, among whom Richard Teruskin, whose text and act from 1995, but preceded by a few important articles already in 1988, considered the early music movement to be the most progressive and modern of all approaches, particularly in his sixth chapter, The Modern Sound of Early Music. For Taruskin, the early music revival has nothing at all to do with so-called authenticity, a term that has in and by itself provoked a major polemic in the 1980s and 90s in the British journal Early Music, among other places. In any case, I'm not here to take the early music movement and its ways to approach music to court again, seeking to either convict or absolve it but rather to talk about what research has over the years brought about in terms of enriching our reading of early music texts and of re stimulating our creativity as performers, something that in a certain way has died a slow death already starting with the increasing standardization of performance approaches at the Paris Conservatoire in the early 19th century and in all its subsequent emulators, all the way to our current globalized procedures dictated partly by both the commercial context and the digitalization of sound recordings. As a side note, uh, by early music, I mean virtually anything that has been composed before, let's say 
20 years ago, uh, as long as it uses instruments from the period. Indeed, not just medieval and early modern music as used to be the case up to uh, about 20 years ago as well. And starting as soon as we get even vague hints for performance of recited texts at the turn of the second millennium. In short, when I use the term early music, I'm talking about a thousand years of music. Naturally, when dealing with pre the pre 19th century music, we only have written sources to rely upon. So to illustrate what I think of the necessity of studying the cultural context of any period and area, and area, yes, even quite recently, it would suffice to listen to the performers of a Haydn string quartet or a Mozart symphony in 1970 and one in 2010, even with a conventional modern approach and instruments. It is also clear that we perform, that, uh, we perform uh, Jörgi Ligeti's 1972 double concerto for flute and oboe differently now compared to when it was first composed 50 years ago almost. However, before I proceed with my reflection, and as a second important side note, I would say, I want to emphasize that in my teaching, I've generally been avoiding to use John Butt's term HIP because I find it a little too restrictive. Indeed, the sort of work that is actually done within the fairly recently accepted musicolo musicological discipline of performance practice studies is certainly not limited to the text itself, obviously restored as best as possible according to the scholarly principles of musical philology. It is also not limited to just the instruments we have to transform it into sound, observing all good principles of historical organology. But it is deeply involved in an appropriate reading of that text, what Bruce Haynes called literacy, some sort of a reading competency, which does not include the notion of interpretation as much, but rather that of understanding. And following that of restitution in the sense of restoration or I would say reenactment. Finally, and most importantly, historical performance practice necessarily focuses on an in-depth understanding of the broader cultural context, utilizing methodologies sometimes similar to those of ethnomusicologists in which the musical text at hand was created. If our endeavors were limited to an exclusively historical approach, the result would be a poor one indeed, while an in-depth attention for cultures of the past is nothing but a demonstration of respect for such older and other, often different cultures from ours. For those reasons, I've coined an alternative term, which I much prefer to use, and that is culturally informed performance practices, a term that is starting to be uh, generalized a little bit too, at least in uh, the conservatories in Brussels and Amsterdam quite recently. Now, back to my topic. You probably wonder uh, about the meaning of the first part of my title. And I'm sure you're asking yourself what on earth George Orwell, the early 20th century British novelist and author of Animal Farm in 1984, and the 62-year-old uh, French, actually, Norman uh, socialist, atheist, enlightened, hedonistic, and Epicurean philosopher Michel Lonfray have to do with culturally informed performance practices. Uh, henceforth, instead of this whole long term, I will call it CIPP. Well, let me preface my comments by stating that my quest here today is on the one hand to illustrate the social relevance of such an approach to early music in our current society and political realities, and on the other to reflect upon the meaning, the sense, the significance, and I would even say the necessity and the benefits of teaching and performing such past and diverse repertoires with the attention and respect that the cultures to which they belong are entitled to. And I will conclude my remarks with a few thoughts about how we might address this, even about its general feasibility in society and in our pedagogy 
and concert offerings. In light of the social and political turbulence that has characterized this country in recent years, and especially since last spring, and the ensuing reactions in academic circles to start paying more conscious attention to systemic racism, inequity, and exclusion of the other, I came once again to question the relevance of what I am actually doing through my profession in order to participate in or contribute to fostering uh, a slightly less violent world, maybe. Of course, by extension, my profession, my activities include the scholarly and artistic community in which I operate, the community that reflects upon, teaches, and performs early music still in that widest uh, acceptation of the term. On a side note, I'm also aware that we would be naive or live in Thomas More's utopia if we thought that what occurred on January 6th in Washington, D.C. could never happen again or elsewhere, including in Europe. But my reflection on these painful issues brought me to reread a number of texts, first inspired by my revisiting um, a lecture that Umberto Eco gave at the University of Bologna in mid-May 2008, and that was published three years later as Costruire il Nemico e altri scritti occasionali and translated into English in 2011 as Inventing the Enemy and Other Occasional Writings. I'll not go into Eco's essay here, but since he discusses both the novel 1984 and the allegorical novella Animal Farm, I was drawn to reread those as well. Subsequently, I landed upon Michel Onfray's 2019 book titled Théorie de la Dictature, which presents a reflection on the looming dangers and returning totalitarian dictatorships as exemplified in Orwell's critique of early 20th century extreme right Nazism and fascism and extreme left Bolshevism and Maoism. Indeed, although we can feel the threats of, Trumpian, of Trumpism directly and viscerally here in the US, we also should be closely watching for this tendency to reemerge elsewhere. We currently see too many similar upsurges happening in a variety of European, Asian, African, and South American nations to remain unaffected by them. In fact, I watch with fear what people like Viktor Orban is doing in Hungary or what Andrzej Duda is turning Poland into, what Putin is doing in the Russian Federation and Erdogan in Turkey, but also uh, I'm worried about many others like Marine Le Pen of the Front National in France, Matteo Salvini in the Lega in, Ital in Italy, Geert Wilders in the PVV in the Netherlands, Tom van Grieken in the Vlaams Belang in Belgium, or the Partido Popular in Spain, the AFD in Germany, to name just a few. I could go on, unfortunately all seem to have forgotten the consequences of similar politics almost one century ago now. In his analysis of uh, Orwell's two novels, Onfray identifies the ingredients that could lead to new dictatorships today. And he organizes them into seven basic actions. First, destroy freedom. Second, impoverish the language. Third, abolish truth. Fourth, suppress history. Five, negate nature. Six, propagate hatred. And seven, aspire to the empire. While each of these actions, which he calls temps, as times, is characterized by particular uh, moments. In the PowerPoint, uh, I'll be showing you the original French text, uh, but I'll translate Onfray's points through, uh, though illustrated here and there with my own comments and parallels to what is actually currently going on. So the first point, in order to destroy freedom, he says, there must be continuous surveillance. Personal life needs to be ruined 
Solitude must be suppressed, so no chance for personal reflection. We have to enjoy mandatory festivities. The general opinion must be standardized, domination of standardized tests, for instance. Crimes of thought need to be denounced. His second uh, action is to impoverish uh, language. In order to do that, we need to practice a new language, which we, for instance, find in you know, text or SMS or Facebook abbreviations almost. Use double language or double standards, destroy words, that is reduce vocabulary, even in academic prose, make language oral, loss of literacy and almost exclusive use of spoken language register. Speak one single language, that is suppressed dialects, create international English as we can hear it too often in continental Europe today even. Suppress the classics in the most general sense of the term, ancient languages and their linguistic structures and teach us so many uh, interesting things. Third, to abolish truth, we need to teach ideology. We need to exploit the press, spread fake news or alternative facts, if you prefer, produce reality. See, for instance, reality shows on TV. In order to suppress history, we have to cancel the past, rewrite history, invent memory, destroy books and industrialize literature. In this context, uh, and maybe as a short parenthesis, I'd like to quote a brief excerpt from Chris Hedges' uh, 2009 best-selling book, Empire of Illusion, The End of Literacy and the Triumph of Spectacle. He writes the following on page 44, which in my mind is a little, is quite worried, worrisome actually. And I quote, functional Illiteracy in North America is epidemic, he says. There are 7 million illiterate Americans, which is 0.3%, uh, which is actually better than in some European countries. Another 27 million are unable to read well enough to complete a job application, and 30 million cannot read a simple sentence. There are some 50 million who read at a fourth or fifth grade level, Nearly a third of the nation's population is illiterate or barely literate, a figure that is growing by more than 2 million a year. A third of high school graduates never reads another uh, book for the rest of their lives, and neither do 42% of college graduates. In 2007, 80% of the families in the US did not buy or read a book and it is not much better beyond our borders. Canada has an illiterate and semi-literate population estimate at, estimated sorry, at 42% of the whole, a proportion that mirrors that of the US, end quote. And that was 12 years ago. Most European countries might not quite be there yet, but they should not fool themselves that it is going in that direction, that it is not going in that direction, sorry. Going back to Onfray here, to negate nature, we need to destroy the urge or drive of living. That is, provoke climate change and decide not to do anything about it, for instance. Organize sexual frustration, cleanse or sterilize life, proceed medically only. To propagate hatred, we need to create an enemy. And I remind you of Echo's, uh, Umberto Eco's um, essay here. We need to foment war. I don't need to illustrate that. Uh, we turn critical thinking into an act of folly. For instance, defunding the humanities and the universities in, in favor of the hard sciences. And we need to kill the last human. And finally, to aspire to the empire, we need to format children, manage the opposition, govern with the elites, corporatization of politics, enslave thanks to progress, that is control of everything for the purpose of so-called safety, maybe, hide actions of who is in power, absence of transparency in government can be a good example. I think you get the picture. This should suffice as far as red flags go that Orwell and Onfray have raised 
Furthermore, these ideas have also been reflected and corroborated by several political science scholars, such as Chris, Chris Hedges uh, mentioned above or before, and uh, Yale University political philosopher Jason Stanley in his 2018 book, How Fascism Works, The Politics of Us and Them. Among many others, I unfortunately have no time to discuss here today. <clears throat> what I claim though, is that it is exactly in raising awareness of these actions and particular moments as Onfray defines them, and by acting in the opposite direction of what he describes, that we might be able to avoid getting trapped into such a destructive vortex of social degradation, hatred, ignorance, and systemic lying. In fact, I would go as far as to call it a situation comparable to Mao Zedong's cultural uh, revolution of 1949. In our small world, or nel nostro piccolo, as Matteo Molinari would say, of thinking about, of teaching, and of creating and performing music in accordance with the philosophy and mechanisms of culturally informed performance practices, we can indeed significantly contribute to understanding, respecting, and furthering a more, more diverse, inclusive, and equitable world. And that is what I see as perhaps the most socially relevant significance of cultivating CIPP. Conversely, I'm also not claiming that mainstream performance practices entirely follow the principles of Onfray's totalitarian model, uh, model, though some do, of course, but even in the early music movement, but rather that in the basic principles of the CIPP approach, there is a stronger tendency to take more distance from such a model, be it unconsciously so sometimes, particularly because of both the CIPP's fundamental and foundational interests in exploring and understanding a more comprehensive cultural context in which the musical composition at hand is embedded. Deeper understanding creates empathy. And I'm convinced that this is the type of approach that is required to avert the dystopic society we risk to fall into or end up with. This is why I believe CIPP have an important role and our conservatories, uh, uh, in our conservatories and schools of music. It's been fascinating for me to watch what over the, four, the last 45 years or so, what the early music movement has meant in today's uh, music world. Born almost as a countercultural current, in a moment of philosophical structuralism, the CIPP movement has experienced a gradual conventionalization or what I would call with the neologism mainstreamization of the concepts used by its protagonists beginning in the 1990s. Hoping to get CIPPs accepted as a legitimate department in conservatories and universities we have seen both a watering down of the movement's initially fairly revolutionary precepts and then a gradually increasing adoption of some of these principles by the mainstream. To put it simply, the old thesis, the conventional approach, let's say, and its antithesis, the HIP movement, have evolved almost, don't know quite, into a synthesis which will become the new thesis. And whether we believe in Hegelian dialectic or not, I propose that it is urgent that the CIPP movement strive to become the new antithesis. I believe that what we need is to reinvigorate rethinking and to react more forcefully sorry, against this conventionalization I alluded to. We need again, and more urgently than ever maybe, to work hard to stay away from easy standardizations, especially when we see that such ideas so often get promoted by commercial motivations. Playing all early modern uh, European repertoires with the same Baroque violin and maybe a couple of different bows or using your standard French double early 18th century harpsichord copy to play Michelangelo Rossi, Elisabeth Jacquet de la Guerre and Domenico Scarlatti 
is in essence not much different from playing Bach, Mozart, and Froberger on the same nine foot Steinway. Not anymore. We know better after seven decades of research. I'm convinced that it is precisely by counteracting such a globalized conventionalization that we will improve our understanding of and empathy with the other, our awareness of the richness of diversity of past and present, local, regional, and national communities and societies, and by extension, our respect for everybody when we consider and treat everyone equitably and inclusively. Through its natural inclination, inclination towards other performance practices and also to non-canonical repertoires, though not exclusively, including those of gender and ethnic or racial minorities, the principles honored by CIPP are already offering a tiny fraction, I think, of what society needs for healing and for moving forward, but the small world of CIPP needs to be, again, reinvigorated and go much further and deeper instead of sometimes selling itself off, for example, in some sometimes tasteless crossover productions that fall into the category of lucrative and even vulgar spectacle. Indeed, we need to consciously step away from and counteract the inherent intellectual dishonesty that allows for such ludicrous productions. So in what follows, I'd like to illustrate with a few examples, um, not even from a, a, a very obscure part of music history, because that would be too easy, I think, but from someone everybody knows, or so I assume, Johann Sebastian Bach, after which I will expand a bit on the same thoughts in other areas and situations in my own recent research on uh, bass violence or cello in general. As many others have written, and I repeat it, the notation is not the music, meaning that our cultural exploration of the musical context of a piece of notation begins once we go beyond the score. We then need to, feel uh, to find answers to our questions of delivery, vortrag or capacita oratoria, in other words, of rhetorical elocution in the arts of declamation, of representation, in the visual arts, and in the history of thought in political, social, economic, religious, language, and literary history in a very precise location and historical moments. In this sense, performance practice studies, I think, are among the most interdisciplinary and most thoroughly humanistic subdisciplines of musicology. In fact, this sort of multi-pronged or multilateral humanistic intellectual activity and approach is exactly what Orwell, Onfray, but also Echo, Hedges, Stanley, and others have defined as needing to be destroyed for a totalitarian regime to be successful. So let go, let's go against that grain. So let's talk about Bach for a bit. <clears throat> When we dare to question the received performance practice traditions that deal with the canonical monuments of music history, such questions often end up being mixed blessings in the sense that as far as performance practice based in the cultural literacy I was talking about uh, is concerned, it does not always conform to what musicians, musicologists and audiences have in their ears or are ready to accept. We have seen it, for example, beginning in 1992 and culminating between 1996 and 98 with the ongoing polemic back then about the large anachronistic choirs of a more Mendelssohnian than Bachian tradition in Bach sacred compositions in which Joshua Rifkin and Andrew, Andrew Parrott opposed Andreas Glöckner and Tom Koopman, the latter quietly supported by Christoph Wolf on the size of Bach's choirs, between quotation marks. Even though since the exemplary book by Andrew Parrott, The Essential Bach Choir, published in 2000, there are still a number of fossils, including some who pretend to be representatives of the CIPP movement, and I spare you their names, who obstinately keep refusing and ignoring the amounts of historical and cultural evidence that many capable scholars have assembled 
on the subject of renouncing to the romantic imaginary that the choirs of Bach were not in essence conceived for more than one or maximum two singers per part. That is two when three pianists are involved, by the way. So as I said, it's often risky to attack the powerful and extremely hard to change the perspective of those who are too deeply anchored in their beliefs. As my father-in-law used to say, don't confuse me with the facts, my mind's made up. And that is often the most frustrating part of being a scholar involved in performance practice studies that is trying to convince those who think they know because it is the way it's always been done um, and the ways they have grown up with. In my experience, the public is the most receptive uh, to being convinced. And then the musicologists, the musicians, and ultimately, and I insist in that order, the concert and festival organizers who are usually the hardest to persuade to change their habits, even if they're based in quicksand, because their interests are elsewhere, often commercial, and in a sense, very understandably so. Organizers are also convinced that they know better than the public. They decide what to feed the masses, very much in the same anti-democratic sense of Onfray's seventh action of aspiring to the empire. Indeed, it is much easier to present changing and even revolutionary ideas about performance practice in a context of less sacrosanct composers, such as, for instance, Salamone Rossi, Zelenka, Iranek, Perti, Colonna, Barbara Strozzi, Suorvizzana, uh, Quirino Colombani, Antonio Scandello, uh, Cozzolani, Manuel de Thumaya, or Joseph Bologna Chevalier de Saint-Georges, and thousands of others. And yet, in recent research contexts, there are often great initiatives who pick up precisely this type of questions and issues, such as the symposium uh, organized by the University of Leuven in December 2008, and of which the proceedings were gathered in the 2010 May issue of the British Journal Early Music. The least one can say, if we continue this train of thought, for example, about the number of singers used in Bach's Kirchenkonzert in Leipzig in the second quarter of the 18th century, the least, what, the least we can say is that this polemic has triggered a new stimulus to scholarship into the often difficult issues of Bach's music. And that, it, that at a time, it has helped elucidate several other questions of musical rhetoric, instruments and performing forces, of performance venues and their acoustic contexts, of placement of musicians in performance spaces, of temperaments and performing pitches, et cetera, et cetera. I would even add that it has probably actively contributed to the elevation between quotation marks of performance practice studies to the level of acceptable academic musicology in the sense of a true Musikwissenschaft. When I was a student in the early 1980s in Belgium, this aspect of research was still considered suspicious, even unacceptable by my professors and by many continental uh, European musicology in general. While such scholars as Howard Mayer Brown, Neil Zaslaw, Peter Waltz, Frederick Neumann, Peter, Hol uh, Peter Holman, Susan McClary, Jeffrey Kurtzman, Lawrence Dreyfus, and many others, mostly in the Anglo-American world, were already publishing solid scholarly studies in this branch of cultural studies. From all these reflections, we have learned, for example, that the harpsichord was often juxtaposed to the organ in Bach's musical sermons, the Kirchenkonzerte that the double bass was mostly superfluous since the organist who typically played the bass line on an uh, eight or 16 foot stop on the pedal board of a large church instrument and not on the little positives that sound more like vacuum cleaners uh, and that most ensembles use still today. That trumpets were truly natural without the two or four holes to correct intonation that are so important today to both trumpet players and directors were, by the way, every bit as anachronistic as those pseudo-Baroque trumpets. <clears throat> you see if you uh, Baroque trumpet here with, with the holes, uh, 
uh, whereas uh, some people now are playing the instrument with just one hand and no assistance of the other to, um, to adjust the pitch. We have also discovered that the pitch of the organ was often a full step above that of the strings and woodwinds in the band, that neither the viola nor the cello or the double bass uh, were in any way standardized in terms of shape, tuning, and playing techniques as they would become at the end of the 18th century. That the violone at some point in time was not necessarily a 16 foot double bass, but indeed an eight foot instrument. And I'm, turn, I'm talking about not the size of the instrument, but the pitch, the eight foot pitch with the low C at the bottom of the bass clef. Just like the violoncello and the uh, bass viola da gamba, for instance. Here we see a few instruments uh, made by Krauchthaler uh, of the Alemannische Schule, late 17th century preserved in uh, the Berlin Musical Instrument Museum with uh, a treble, violin, an alto, a tenor, a cello, violoncello if you want, a little smaller than the modern cello, and the violone a little larger than uh, the modern cello, but a little smaller, quite a bit smaller than the double bass actually. So we are also now much more aware than ever that there are still crucial questions to be answered about wind instruments. The types of organs Bach used, the strings and bows used in Thüringen and in Sachsen at the time, the issue of sopranos and altos and Bach's vocal compositions, the tunings and temperaments Bach might have used, for, instance, for example, in his Voltemperitus Clavier, as opposed to his sacred compositions the way of accompanying recitatives in the Kirchenkonzert, uh, the basso continuo realization four parts or not, and the use of string and wind instruments in the basso continuo section. And I can go on here too. Not only has research in archives and organology and iconography and in music history and culture in general allowed us to address and sometimes to solve a number of these questions, at least for those interested in finding answers to those questions. But that research has also triggered a multitude of new investigation tracks, which will only enrich our knowledge and ultimately also our appreciation of certain practices that are indeed more culturally appropriate and that prohibit the sort of complacency, satisfaction even in a state of inertia, immobility or status quo, usually promoted through conventionalized performances. It is a fact that an attitude of constant questioning and reassessment is fundamental in this field, just like in research in general, but that it is sometimes also hard to persevere in over one's entire professional career, particularly if that career is connected to an official and accredited institution. However, I believe that more than ever, the early music movement, for lack of a better word, is in profound need of a new revolution, an active return to questioning assiduously all the accepted practices, which in the course of the last six or seven decades have now unfortunately been watered down to new conventions, parallel to the old mainstream the early music movement initially rebelled against in the 1960s. Causes for this are obviously multifarious, standardization, can be forced upon us for practical, commercial, or procedural reasons. Uh, out of inertia or intellectual laziness and complacency, as I alluded to earlier, and so forth. But the failure or refusal of constantly questioning ourselves, combined with a lack of creativity, is ultimately what ends up causing a loss of interest among audiences as well. To some of my performance students, especially in Europe, uh, who often claim that since the generations preceding them have already done all the research, or so they think, they are in no need of getting into libraries, archives, museums, and the study of treatises themselves, especially now that access to all the resources has been made so much easier than ever before through the internet. To that um, question of these students, I answer that with the knowledge and insights we have acquired so far, we are in a great place to take everything to the next step and that we are always in need of fresh and creative ideas and new understanding to move forward. 
If the early music movement was initially in part also a search into new sounds and timbres, recent research is taking that specific aspect uh, onto a new level. Suffice it to think of truly natural trumpets, still in need of being played a little better perhaps, just like the cornettos in the 1960s, but they got it together and are now playing quite well. Also of better pure gut strings. Uh, we still haven't reached the craftsmanship that some of the string makers uh, had achieved in Naples and Rome uh, in the 17th century today. Uh, also of the great variety in the instruments of the violin or of the harpsichord family and so forth and so on. But what this recent scholarship in Bach's music at the end of last century has signified for me personally, has been a chance to completely reevaluate the questions concerning the bass instruments of the violin family and their use in the many different European, local and regional musical contexts. I had written my master's thesis on the subject for the University of Ghent in 1984, and I was actually quite satisfied and relaxed in the facts, or rather the chimera, that my ideas were clear about that the violoncello was supposed to be in early modern music. So much so that I had continued my musicological work into a completely different direction, that of late 17th century sacred music in Bologna. Until Baroque violinist Sigiswald Kuyken showed me his new acquisition in 2004, his so-called violoncello da spalla, built by a Russian luthier and violinist, Dmitry Badiarov in Brussels at that time, he's now in The Hague. Not all too convinced by the instrument's sound, uh, I did of course know Gregory Barnett's article, The Violoncello da Spalla, Shouldering the Cello in the Broke Era, which he published in 1998 in uh, JAMIS, the Journal of the American Musical Instruments Society. So I did not immediately discard that violoncello da spalla as an aberration, as I do now, by the way, but I won't go that into that here. So I decided to look into it all again, and thus launched back again into research on the various terms I encountered, viol viola pomposa, violoncello piccolo, violoncello, violone, violoncino, viola da spalla, and many other terms that refer to bass violins of all kinds of sizes and shapes about 14 years ago, I participated in the aforementioned symposium in Leuven in 2008. In my presentation back then, uh, I basically just asked the question for what instrument did Bach compose and conceive his, not just the cello suites, but also uh, the parts, the solo parts that he wrote for violoncello and violoncello piccolo in a dozen of his Kirchen concerta. So starting from this fairly focused research on the cellos, and I insist on the plural here of Bach, I was no longer able to leave it at just that. And so I continued the work, always on a regional, even very local level, exploring one by one, the various bases of the violin family, their repertoires and playing techniques in small regions such as Padua and Venice, the Po Valley and Emilia, the region basically triangle between Modena, Ferrara and Bologna, in Rome, at, in Corelli's time, in the early 18th century in Naples, in Paris and London, and so on. Stimulated by annual symposia, I organized with my Baroque cello colleagues at both Brussels conservatories, the Flemish and the Francophone, since Belgium is divided linguistically, Every year we chose to uh, focus on a specific school of cello playing, which allowed me to present my most recent findings through talks and workshops to Baroque cello students and professionals, and then to test the results in discussions, tryouts and performances, which ultimately allowed me to correct or even completely reconsider some of my scholarly ideas, understandings or theories, even before I took them to the printing press. This was, or, I should say is, it is actually still going on, not only a rare privilege, but I think also the best argument for the fact that scholarship and research can not only inform performance practice, but also conversely, that performance practice and intellectually honest artistic approaches can fundamentally alter or at least deeply inform scholarship as well. 
Um, and I will very quickly show in a few images that testified to the diversity of um, the violoncello family in the early modern period here. So I'll just go through a few examples of iconography. Um, we basically uh, start from the idea that the Baroque cello is what we see here in this painting by Pompeo Batoni, uh, a Roman painter. Uh, it's an attribution to Batoni. We also think it might be a portrait of Boccherini playing also because of the shape of the instrument, which could remind us of uh, the Stradivari uh, early 18th century instruments that um, Boccherini, Boccherini never really owned. He had a Steiner instrument actually and a smaller other instruments. We don't know quite what. In any case, this is also the type of uh, the way of holding the instrument, the shape of the instrument, the type of bow, the way of holding the bow, the uh, string um, use of three gut strings and one wire one uh, string that Michel Corrette describes in his 1741 method pour apprendre un peu de temps et dans sa perfection le violoncelle. So one of those many methods that, uh, that Corrette wrote about virtually every single instrument and that I consider sort of a manifesto of a new type of instrument, which was actually addressed not at the professionals, but at the um, dilettante or uh, um, uh, musicians who did not play cello as their profession. And basically uh, the 1960s or the musicians in the late 50s and early 1960s who sort of restituted the uh, Baroque cello, started from both this method and this kind of iconography to pretty much reconstruct what they considered to be the Baroque cello, even though both the treatise and most iconography that attested that uh, was actually from after the Baroque period, right in the middle of the Galant period. On the other hand, this kind of instrument, this kind of bow did not push the contemporary modern cellists too far, far out of their comfort zone to actually approach the older instrument. But if we look at uh, iconography, and I'm just going to show you a few examples here, which are sort of representative of the thousands of images that uh, my colleagues and I have gathered uh, in order to sort of figure out shapes of instruments, size of instruments, uh, number of strings, placement of, of the bridge, uh, whenever it can be attendably uh, you know, understood from iconography, but also the shape of the bow, the way the bow is held, uh, we'll see an enormous variety, which uh, through the sort of 1960s early music movement kept going into that standardized way of the late 18th century. So here in a painting by Anton Domenico Gabbiani uh, that represents the music, a group portrait of musicians of the Medici family in the late uh, 17th century, we see an instrument that is compared to the body of the player, at least a much larger instrument. The bow is clearly held underhand. We see a very clear thick G or F string, whatever it is, and then an equally thick white string, which is a silver wound uh, string. We also see, for instance, the, the softness of the gut strings as they hang out of the peg box, which is something that uh, we haven't or only have encountered pretty rarely today in modern string making that you have such a flexibility of strings. So all these elements, uh, can give us uh, hints. And it's not the one iconographic example that will of course give us all the information, but it's out of the multitude of um, examples that we can draw a few um, um, conclusions. You also see that the instrument is held much lower compared to the body in the here, probably, although we, we can't see the bottom of the instrument, the instrument is probably held on the floor. Here we have in uh, Gerrit van Onthorst, uh, painting, although it was done in Rome. He was uh, known in Rome as Gerardo delle Notti because he painted in the Caravagesco tradition. 
And here we have a clearly smaller instrument also held on the ground uh, with five pure gut strings and an underhand held bow in a fairly realistic uh, representation of the instrument here. A typically Dutch type of instrument, by the way. Here, uh, one century apart, two uh, sculpture, well, one sculpture and one uh, drawing. Uh, one, the sculpture is from the uh, cathedral in Fribourg in Switzerland and represents a large, large-ish bass violin played, uh, held with a strap that you can see here and also uh, represented in this uh, picture. Uh, two instruments played in procession, as uh, was often done in the 17th century. This instrument here has frets, uh, a shape that is not necessarily the, the shape of the modern cello, but there was there too a great variety in shapes. What's interesting is that one instrument here, the 17th century instrument is played with underhand bow grip, the 18th century with overhand bow grip, but what's also interesting is the position of the bridge, which is under the F holes, whereas most uh, modern luth luthiers will put the bridge right in the middle of the F holes here. Here another representation, a uh, con uh, concert in Casa Lazzari in Carpi, which is near uh, Modena Reggio Emilia in this area of Parma. Actually, here we have an instrument played not between the legs, but on the lap with a very clear underhand uh, bow position. And here we have actually a nun playing a large bass violin too that is fretted as opposed to the smaller instrument. So we may very well have here uh, the presence of a violoncello and a violone that were typical in so many compositions in the Baroque period. And here, um, a painting attributed to uh, Girardini uh, from Bologna in the 1730s. Here you see uh, someone holding a large size cello type instrument, uh, probably because he wasn't able to read the music if he had been sitting next to the harpsichordist in this chamber music context. We actually see that pretty often, if not always, the, the cello or the bass violin is held in this vertical way or in this uh, horizontal way, just like a, a large violin in spaces where the performer did not have enough space to play standing or seated so that the instrument was reversed and held over balustrade in the balcony. We see that in the very narrow uh, uh, balconies near Italian organs and so many Italian uh, iconography. We see it in concert arrangements where the musicians are sort of standing uh, in rows, one behind, behind the other, and these rows are quite narrow in their construction. So since so many cellists were trained as violin family instrument uh, performers, they played pretty much all sizes of the family, whether it was the treble, the alto, the tenor, or the bass. So they were perfectly capable of playing a simple bass line with a large instrument like that. That's one of the problems with Sigiswald Kajakin's modern violoncello da spalla is that it is barely larger than a viola. It only has the thickness that is proportional to a cello, but uh, the copies um, that Badiarov made of the instruments by uh, Hoffmann, uh, those instruments, those originals are probably 19th century reconstructions and uh, not conform to what was the norm in the 1730s anyway. And we see that use of the cello in uh, narrow balconies uh, here in the 1740s still, that's in one of the insignia in Bologna, where a pretty large instrument is actually held on the balcony, because that's the only way to get the sound to get across. With a large double bass, uh, as you see the instrument behind the horns there, there is plenty of room uh, because the balustrade comes pretty much at the level of the uh, bridge of the instrument, so the sound comes across. With the cello, the entire instrument is actually playing against the wooden balustrade, uh, 
So in order to project the sound, the instrument needs to be turned around so that the sound can be, you know, going down into the, um, uh, the, the audience space, which is often quite a bit lower. And so here you see the collection of instruments that Bruno Coxet, a cellist in Brittany, has assembled based on historical model on iconography and excluding this these two tiny instruments in the front here, all the others are bass violin, some with four strings, some with five strings, some one with six strings and frets, a few uh, a smaller instrument here that is actually taken, uh, copied from a painting by Bartolomeo Bettera, who was a student of Baschenis, uh, both luthiers also. Here you see another cello, four string instrument, smaller, with a different shape that reminds us a little bit of the lira da braccio. So basically, to answer the question, what is the Baroque cello? Well, here are a few possibilities. They're definitely not all of them, but the Baroque cellos in the plural are a multitude of very diverse instruments uh, where the instruments were very specific sometimes to very specific locations and uh, sometimes had um, names that do not necessarily conform to what we are used to today. So this instrument with six strings here uh, would definitely be called a violone, even though it played pretty much at the same pitch as the cello, except for the lower uh, G string. Uh, so it's basically a G violone, for those of you who know that term. Uh, the, the five string cello is typically tuned uh, C, G, D, A, and then a higher D, a fourth up, because if it is of that large size, uh, a high E string, as Bach asks for in the sixth cello suite, uh, will break very often. And I think the reason why he asks for a specifically, not just five string instrument, but five string instrument with an E string is something that indicates something that is not necessarily the norm. <clears throat> So um, just to give you a, a short little uh, insight in uh, some of the, the work I've done on the cellos, and that includes also an enormous variety of types of bows and uh, the adoption of underhand uh, playing as almost the norm for most uh, Baroque cello uh, performance practices. So moreover, uh, our Brussels experimentations I was talking about with bass violins of large, the violoni, and small sizes, the violoncelli with four, fives, or even six strings, tuned in a variety of ways, played seated, standing, in procession, uh, with over and underhand bowing, with diatonic and chromatic left-hand fingerings, because we're working on that too and so forth, are now beginning to inspire and stimulate players all over the globe. In fact, I just completed, completed and we talked about it yesterday, a recording and score edition project last year of Antonio Vandini's complete works for cello. Vandini, by the way, was Tartini's cellist in Padua and was famous for still playing the cello, holding the bow in the old fashioned way, that is, underhand, as you can see here, as witnessed also by several people, including Charles Burney. So that um, project of Antonio Vandini's complete works for cello, uh, in which I collaborated with cellist Eleanor Fry from Montreal, uh, we basically both played uh, the instruments holding the bow in underhand grip as Vandini did until he died in 1778. Now, this grip, as I said, was the norm pretty much everywhere in the 17th century, except in the 24 Violons du Roi uh, um, under Lully, who really wanted all the instrumentalists to play in the same way, holding the bows the same way. And uh, Neapolitan cellists, who as students of the Conservatori in Naples, of course, learned all the instruments of the violin family and were often trained by violinists. Uh, one of the first cellists, uh, Franceschiello or Francesco Alborea, or even Supriani, uh, 
uh, were people who were trained by violinists, such as uh, Kai Law, for instance, about whom uh, Guido Olivieri has uh, written several articles. But that means that these cellists often played the larger instrument still holding the bow overhand. So when a lot of Neapolitan musicians uh, emigrated to Paris or to London, they introduced this way of playing there too. And that pretty much happens at the time Michel Corrette is writing his manifesto method uh, for the cello. And uh, following that, basically this Neapolitan tradition <clears throat> that will uh, continue um, in France will get sort of uh, standardized by the Paris Conservatory and it is only after the 1770s that we start seeing a complete disappearance of underhand bow playing for bass violence in general. So indeed it is thanks to these annual collaborations with the Brussels conservatories, but not only those, that uh, I could almost turn around what we usually call research in the service of practice into practice in the service of research. Whatever it is, in my experience, this is an absolutely mutual and bilateral collaboration. So in conclusion of my remarks and reflections through these few examples, I should emphasize that I firmly believe that these few case studies on Bach and the cello can easily be expanded and applied to all periods and issues in music history from the high middle ages through the end of the 20th century. And that it should be clear that performance without research is about as crippled as research without performance. My utmost hope is to be able to help foster a reinvigoration of original and creative research to move the early music movement out of its current tendencies towards little lax standardization and stagnation or towards an easy though lucrative proneness to contamination and crossover spectacles. Although I'm delighted and hopeful to see that such a reinvigoration is already happening in several schools and ensembles, mainly through the impetus of a few scholar performers and performer scholars. It is, however, by no means the easiest approach to adopt, and it needs to be stimulated much more than it has been, including by, uh, including by the institutions in which we all work. And to ultimately circle back to my initial quest for the meaning and relevance of CIPP today, if taken seriously and thoroughly, its basic principles of broader cultural interest and respect, attention to minorities of gender and ethnicity, to non-conformist attitudes, and to non-canonical representatives of society can, in my opinion, profoundly contribute to a society that is anchored in precepts of true diversity, equity, and inclusion. And though, uh, and though there is still much work to do to be done in that direction, uh, I also believe that through its fundamentally multidisciplinary approach, culturally informed performance practices may very well be a convincing remedy in artistic endeavor and education against the dangers of looming totalitarianism that George Orwell has warned us against in his novels and that Michel Onfray, among others, has theorized in his reflections. As for its practical feasibility in the current existing institutional pedagogical structures and performance realities, I'm optimistic enough to believe that it could happen, though it will still uh, take some serious rethinking and even some resetting of parts of the system and of our mentalities, as we have seen in the fascinating uh, presentations we had Monday morning about diversifying um, the early music curriculum and to rethink our pedagogy too. And um, this is the right form, I think, for such a reflection, since I dare to assume that attendees of this presentation have the deeper interests and potentialities of the cultural uh, informed the performance practices at heart. So if we start from a basic intellectual and artistic honesty that does not settle for finding quick fixes and solutions to complex issues, it is possible to achieve an active reinvigoration of moving into in, in a decisive manner against the pitfalls of totalitarianism that Michel Onfray illustrates. <clears throat> 
I'm thinking particularly about the perils of the establishment of a single language and poor vocabulary, of the cancellation of history and of the past, of the destruction of a literate book reading culture, and of the conviction that critical thinking is an act of folly. We may not always like what has occurred in the past. In fact, we rarely do. But we need to be more aware of it, maybe more, more than ever before, in order to understand the mechanisms of why humanity has failed where it did and avoid that it fails again. There is indeed an urgent need in institutions of secondary and higher education for investigating in higher and more efficient literacy of a broader and more in-depth knowledge of the past, of our own and others' history, of multilingualism, of a critical approach to sources and resources in order to provide a more comprehensive and effective education. I've always strongly believed in the power of education in which students are given pathways and methodologies that enable them to tackle such cultural issues and to learn how to critically evaluate the presence or absence of intellectual and artistic honesty and to enable them to present the results of such honesty through their performances and choices in performance practices. And the public will necessarily be convinced and appreciative while the music business will, uh, the, the music business world, sorry, will just have to follow suit. If quality music of a more distant past is presented in a persuasive and culturally aware manner, it can be self-sufficient and it does not need the sometimes tasteless gimmicks or multimedia and crossover shortcuts to be able to strike the audience's emotions and imagination. In political terms, I would compare this with populism and history has shown where that can lead to. But that aptitude to being persuasive as a musician begins with the acquisition of a much deeper humanistic education than has been offered to them in these last two or three decades. Finally, education is also a need of a reinstatement. Uh, education is also in need of a reinstatement, a reactivation of the awareness of the importance of an understanding of history and of a hunger for multilingualism and literacy in the broadest sense of the term. They should be brought back as the centerpiece of our pedagogical uh, philosophies and no longer be dwelling purposeless in the periphery, I think. Only then will, be, will we be able to learn to respect and celebrate diversity and empathy for the other while eradicating inequity and exclusion. And a culturally informed performance practices approach can operate as a small but powerful agent in that discourse. There might be some hope indeed if universities and conservatories give it or continue to give it a chance. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark, for this just fantastic and very thought provoking uh, presentation. We have time for questions. So um, for our attendees here, on Zoom, if you have a question, please go ahead and put your name in the chat. Um, we already have Alana. Alana has a question. Go ahead and unmute. Hi. Um, this was so um, wonderful and gave me so much to think about. Thank you so much. Um, my question is a very practical one about the structuring of conservatories and universities. Mm -hmm. um, because the thing that I kept thinking about was you know, how um, incriminating it is <laughs> when if the thought of there being sort of a department of culturally informed performance practice and then the other sort of, you know, in theory departments being, I guess, culturally uninformed <laughs> programs or culturally less informed programs and sort of how that fits in with, because now it's so, as you were saying, so institutionalized that there are, you know, historical performance departments or there are, um, you know, programs that you can follow in historically informed violin versus, I guess, regular violin. Um, and so I'm wondering um, how you see those things kind of working out um, in, a, in a very practical structural way um, and whether you would promote sort of emerging of, of all of those departments or, or um, yeah, I'm just wondering about that. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you, that's a great question. Because, you know, back in the eighties when we as young graduates were sort of fighting to get early music in the 
conservatories, not in the universities in, in Europe, that uh, there's no place for that. That's not a performance uh, oriented type of school anyway. But when we were fighting for these early music departments, then 10, 15, well, we managed to get them. But 10, 15 years later, we realized we fought for this. And you know what? Unfortunately, we got them. So <laughs> it has been a bit of a mixed blessing in the sense that what it has achieved is compartmentalization, or I would even say almost segregation with complete, you know, uh, disrespect for the other side. And that was not the purpose we had. It just turned out that way because, of course, you know, you invite a number of faculty members, uh, the specialist in Baroque violin, a Baroque cellist, a, a, a keyboard player, and basically they stick them together in an annex of the building uh, because there's, you know, no room for uh, those strange people in the department. So um, they got sort of ostracized and this, this dynamic sort of collapsed. But um, in the last um, few years, we've started experimenting in the Francophone uh, Conservatory in Brussels to build bridges between the two. And we, for instance, all um, Baroque players or everyone, of course, we have a department there of about 85 students and 35 uh, faculty members uh, where we make sure that uh, the students have courses in both areas and uh, our colleagues in the modern area, you know, the modern violinist, uh, everyone, every student has the possibility to be exposed to working with the Baroque violinist, you know, every pianist, gets to work with forte piano. And it has become mandatory for everyone to basically um, study repertoires of the pre 20th century on uh, instruments of the earlier periods too, which sort of brings the so-called mainstream idea within uh, a, a much more culturally informed uh, conservatory. And I think it's only by merging the two and by actually a kind of collaboration that we can get that mutual respect to work uh, instead of by, you know, ostracizing the two and, and keep them separate because, you know, in some, in some schools, there's still the mentality of, you know, you, you can go study your, your cello suite with the Baroque cellist, but in my studio, you have to play it right. Right. So this is the kind of, of, of uh, I was flunked for my final exam on cello because back in the 80s, I had dared to bring my Baroque cello and play my cello suite. And the two members of the jury who were against it basically closed the books and left the room and gave me a zero, which, you know, gave me the result of not getting the diploma in, in cello. But at that point, you know, I was moving into uh, different kinds of, of areas and, and I thought, OK, this is not working, we need to find different solutions. And uh, I think we, we can get there, but it needs mutual respect and it needs collaboration uh, from both sides. And, uh, and I have to say in Brussels, we have good hopes that this is starting to work quite nicely. We're also introducing multi-instrumentalism for people who do 17th and 18th century music. And we are also introducing some uh, pedagogical elements um, that comes straight out of the Neapolitan conservatories of the 18th century. So we have a great director there who allows us to experiment with a whole lot of things. And so it's, it's an interesting place to be. <clears throat> but thanks for your question, because that's something we struggle with pretty much everywhere. And I'm sure many people in the audience uh, who teach uh, historical performance practice probably deal with that issue as well. Thank you. We have a couple of questions from the YouTube. Um, the first one is, would you give some examples of crossover spectacles? Oh, well, you know, some of the things that I, I, I sort of hate to, to, to give names of musicians because, you know, everybody does it in, in good faith. But some of the productions that we see done, for instance, by ensembles like L'Arpeggiata, where, uh, you know, they have... Uh, an interesting, it's actually a, a great recording. And it's a lot of 
fun to listen to and great musicianship, but where they do um, you know, music from all around the Mediterranean, north, south, and east of the Mediterranean, and just plug in you know, one musician from uh, Greece or from Turkey or from Syria or from Egypt or from Algeria to sort of join the band where you have a Theorbo and a, you know, Italian late 17th century type uh, harpsichord and then do uh, tarantelle or things that come out of a very specific area of southern Italy, which is the, the Salento mostly. And so this to me is a little bit of looking for shortcuts where instead of really addressing, you know, the music of the culture you're interested in uh, and, and use the instrumentarium uh, from the area, from the tradition, rather than sort of mixing and matching all kinds of things because it sells, you know, to me, that's a little intellectually dishonest. Um, but, you know, you have many types of crossovers. I remember uh, some ensembles specialized in Italy in madrigals, the conductor of the ensemble loved jazz, but was never trained as a jazz musician, then started performing Monteverdi as if it were jazz. I'm not sure. <laughs> this is, of course, a taste issue. And uh, my taste certainly doesn't go into that direction. I know it pleases, you know, some audiences. Um, and so be it, but I think if music is performed in an honest and culturally what I would call appropriate way, I think it suffices itself. It doesn't need to, to use all these, these sort of uh, shortcuts. Again, this is my personal opinion and I know uh, not many people share it. And some crossovers are really well done, but so many are not. And I think it can be dangerous in you know, in, in, in trying to, especially when, when we try to think about going even deeper in, in digging up the, 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 the enormous diversity that existed in, in the cultures of the past or in other cultures in, in general than, than even just the West European, or then some of the difference between what was done in Bologna and what was done in Modena and what was done in, in Venice, where people, you know, didn't necessarily even understand each other. And in some cases, musicians traveled from one spot to another, but uh, in other cases, uh, the two styles were absolutely not compatible. So I think, um, yeah, this is, these are a few examples of crossovers, uh, but I think it goes even further than that. Thank you so much. We have another um, really interesting question from the YouTube. It's quite long, so I'm gonna read it directly. It says, I'm fascinated with this linkage between the study of earlier music practices and today's need to support democratic practices. Are you saying that your field has a tension between the inherently conservative project of identifying correct and authentic practices and your recommendation for fresh and creative thinking? If so, is such a tension uh, partially resolved by recognizing the vast diversity of authentic practices versus standardization? It's a big question. Um, of course, I have issues with the term authentic. You can be authentic in a zillion different ways with, with uh, you know, mainstream performances and with historical performances. Um, it's just a bad term. I don't think it's a, it's a useful term, that authenticity term, because I think of authenticity as, as genuine and, and you know, honest musicianship. And that can happen in, in any kind of context, basically. Uh, I don't think that what people do in, in uh, historical or culturally informed performance practices is correct in any way. I think it is trying to get more information and it's definitely interested in trying to understand a score for what it was meant to be in the context in which it appeared. And sometimes I see, um, you know, contemporary musicians uh, 
uh, work with contemporary uh, tools or instruments and <clears throat> uh, not really being interested in what the semiotics of the score could offer. And I find that to be uh, a pity because you lose so much of the richness of what a, a, a piece can do. But I see plenty of, of you know, people in, in the so-called mainstream uh, conservatories who, who have a very honest approach to the score and to trying to understand a lot more than what you see or than what an editor would put in a score to uh, reach a performance, a performance that, that respects uh, a, a variety of cult cultural issues that, to which that, that piece uh, belongs. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm basically bothered by people who just say, it's not, you know, I'm not interested in, in trying to understand beyond what is in the score, uh, just want to play in tune, whatever that means and, and uh, you know, respect what is there. I think that is uh, a little poor and often doesn't restitute the music to all the richness that it could potentially have. So I find it a shame. I don't find it, you know, despicable in any sort. I think it's, it's too bad. I mean, they're missing so much or who, whoever is not interested in going further than just the surface is, is missing so much of what, of, what the music could communicate. I don't know if that's an answer to that long question, but. I think so, I think so. Thank <clears throat> you. I think we have time for one or two more questions. If, if anyone has one, please uh, feel free to drop your name in the chat. But I actually have a very specific question, Mark. Could mm -hmm. you, or would you be willing to take us back to the iconography, um, the Martinelli, the image yeah. of the individual playing, um, not between the legs, but sort of on the lap? This I had one. A question about something that I saw. Let me share my screen here because otherwise you won't see anything. Uh, this one. Um, yes. So, am I seeing some type of strap or something over the bottom of the instrument there? That's what is. What am I seeing there? Oh, you mean this. Yes, what? Oh, it's just the stand. The, oh, I see now, okay. Stand. Yes. Thank you. From my view before, it, it looked like it was some type of strap and I was mistaken. Thank you. Uh, no, no, but it's it's an interesting way of holding the instrument, but you can also see that the hand position is quite oblique. So it's really a type of position that comes from the violin family, this kind of, of, of um, diatonic uh, way of playing the instrument. Whereas on the bass, on the violone here, you see a handhold that is much more like the modern cello, which is chromatic and which is typical of the viola da gamba family. So only here we have this, uh, these two instruments that really illustrate uh, the two major, uh, I would I say, representatives of the bass of the violin, basses of the violin family in in the 17th century, a smaller sort of baritone solo-ish instrument and a larger uh, violone type. Actually, Quantz still mentions in 1752 that any professional cellist um, who's worthy of that uh, name should have two instruments, a smaller one for, for solos with thinner strings and a larger one for ripieno playing, he calls it, uh, with thicker strings and that the bow of the larger uh, instrument should be thicker and have black horse hair, whereas the bow of the solo instrument should have white horse hair, which often indicates a uh, tendency to play the instrument uh, with overhand bowing. So even Quanz advocates for this kind of uh, playing. Thank you, thank you, Mark. And we have one final question from Evan Harger. Evan, hi. Hi, it's so nice to see you and it's wonderful. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Um, my question is about, um, at the beginning of the presentation, you talked about cultural performance practices goal of, um, and I'll, I'll sort of summarize just briefly, uh, <laughs> trying to understand the original context or original audience's uh, point of view perhaps, or 
And uh, my question is how this relates specifically to the idea which you alluded to, and I, I agree with this idea of composer's intention, which we both, you know, I know we both agree that that's a little oversimplified. My question is, would you grant that for a certain limited period of music history that the concept of composer's intention itself becomes a thing that the audience is actually listening for? In other words, is there a way that we can talk about composer's intention as a historicized artifact, limiting it to a specific era of music? And I, I really wanna know when do you think that, if you, if you think that, when do you think that that concern emerges in history on the part of audiences where they're actually listening with the idea of trying to discern the intent of a composer? Hmm. That's, that's an interesting question. When can we start thinking? Uh, of course, <clears throat> once composers start giving more and more precise information in the score, we can start understanding a little bit more about their intentions. And I would say, um, you know, some composers uh, like Boccherini, for instance, is very precise in things he asks for. And not just in terms of tempo, because he uses a lot of terms that are normally not used, you know, at the beginning of a composition to say largo, allegro. No, he will write con smorfia, for instance, or adagio smorf or allegro smorfioso, allegro with, you know, with, with a funny face or something like that, with a grimace. Uh, of course, he comes out of the world of theater and, uh, you know, you can sort of imagine what he had in his mind, but he also uses cleffing in, especially in the cello music and in the quintets, he uses cleffing as indicators of positions on the instrument. So the cleffing is related to the fingering and he might use a, a very um, high clefts that indicate thumb position like an, an alto clef or a soprano clef and then write five ledger lines uh, underneath so that you actually have to play a, high, a low note in a high pitch uh, or in a high position, right? So that is definitely something that uh, Boccherini does to share his intentions, I would say. Uh, and then we get people like Beethoven or Mozart, who Mozart is very persnickety in, in his, his, his uh, articulations. Uh, will be very precise in, in how he articulates things uh, in, in the manuscripts. And um, Beethoven too uh, doesn't let too much to, uh, you know, the, the performance or the performer's ignorance in that. And I think this is a growing tendency with, with uh, the 19th century, but we see it appear with a few musicians, I think already in the second half of the 18th century. Uh, before that, you know, the intention of the composer is sometimes also seen more clearly when you have a situation um, where, for instance, we have manuscripts of uh, performances that we know were happening in a specific location on a specific, uh, during a, a specific celebration. And then we're lucky enough to have the same composer publishing that work that was performed before. And then you sometimes see differences between what you have in the manuscript, uh, which was probably, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the motet here by uh, Giovanni Paolo Colonna in, in Bologna, of which we have the manuscript, <clears throat> which when you put it in score, you realize how many, you know, uh, counterpoint errors there are and parallel fifths and things that you would never uh, dream to see in a published uh, piece of music, but we see it in the manuscript. And we also know that um, his predecessor, Maurizio Cazzati, mentioned in, in a letter somewhere to uh, Arresti when he was attacked for his parallel fifths and his faults in counterpoint, he says, you know, in San Petronio, whether you play parallel fifths or not, nobody's going to hear it, so don't worry about them. But then when he publishes this stuff, it's all cleaned up. Right. So there we have, again, an element of intentionality, but I would say probably until the, um, you know, until we, we are done with the, ret the rhetorical period of music history, as Bruce Haynes calls it, uh, we don't have a whole lot of, um, of information about 
pure intentionality of the composer also because so much is in the hands of of the professional performer who knows how to improvise who knows how to realize bus continuo how to you know all the times that composers don't even mention tempo markings because they know that the performers will know or the performers were people who worked under their conducting directly so um i would say yeah late 18th early 19th century depending on the composers thank you very much great presentation thank you I'm sorry to wrap this up, but I know that you, Mark, and a number of us here have a music king rehearsal to run away to we now. Do. So <laughs> before we go, I want to remind everyone that Music King continues tomorrow. We have uh, Mark Van Skewick and Eric Menzel will be hosting a masterclass here at the University of Oregon that will be live streamed. We have Anna O'Connell from Case Western has uh, done created an intermezzo lecture concert for us. And also the award-winning Baroque ensemble Palla de Musica will be presenting our live streamed concert in the evening. So all of those things will be live streamed. Please make sure that you uh, check in and say hi to us and thank you for coming let's thank mark one more time for this very amazing provocative just what we needed here at music king presentation thank you mark thank you and thank you holly